All right, g'day guys. Um, welcome back to Both Sides Book Club. Now today I am very lonely and sitting on the couch all by myself uh, because, well, for two reasons. One, I got the spicy cough. Um, and secondly, uh, mum is actually flooded in in her property. You may or may not know or have heard on the news or if it has affected you, I'm terribly sorry that we have had a huge natural disaster in um, from Brisbane to northern New South Wales and we've had severe flooding on and off for the last month. Um, a month ago we basically the whole of northern New South Wales just got absolutely it was it was absolutely devastating um, with floods and unfortunately we have yet another round of flooding happening. So Instead of mum being on the couch, we actually have her via Zoom, which is going to be interesting. So hello, mum. Hi, Katie. <laughs> Hi, everyone. This is really, really weird. Instead of the author being being remote, it's me. So hey, now I know what it feels like. <laughs> you're the guest. You're the honorary guest, I guess. Um, but it's very Hi. sad without you on the couch. I miss you already. <laughs> um, so let's hop in, guys, and excuse it if it is a bit awkward and weird because we're very used to bantering together. But um, let's just jump straight into it. So, Mum, perhaps you can give us a recap on what the book was for this month. Sure. Well, hang on, I'm just going to reach behind me. Here we go. So our book this month is Olga Dies Dreaming by Shotil Gonzalez, um, who's um, an American writer from, uh, from um, Brooklyn, and this is her debut novel. Um, and it's, it's great. It's a, it's a kind of it's a family saga um, that centers on two siblings, on Olga and Prieta, her, her brother. Now, Olga's a 40 year old wedding planner who caters to the weddings of all the glitterati of New York. And her brother is a congressman who serves, his area is um, Brooklyn and parts of Manhattan and the areas in which um, uh, the, the siblings grew up. Now, the siblings were abandoned by their mother when Olga was 13. They're of Puerto Rican extraction and she's a revolutionary and wanted to go on fighting the good cause. And their father is uh, an ex-Vietnam veteran who develops um, a heroin addiction and later dies of AIDS. So they're brought up by their grandmother. Um, and the book takes place in 2017, um, uh, which is when Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico. So you've got lots of different things happening in the book, lots of really interesting relationships and lots of fantastic themes that I can't wait to talk to you about. Yeah, amazing. I think the thing that, like, really struck me with this book is so she she addresses, like, I mean, if you want a book that talks about different themes, she literally addresses everything under the sun. You've got racism, you've got white privilege, you've got elitism, you've got misogyny, you've got, um, you know, capitalism, you've got everything under the sun in one book. Um, and I think the only way that you can tackle so many different topics is through having a really strong relationship with the characters in this book. And I think that's probably the first thing I'd love to chat to you, Mum, about is like, I just love how much of a backstory that each of these characters have. I agree. I mean, I think, you know, the book, because there are so many elements of it and so many themes, I think, you know, it could have been at risk of just being a big sloppy meandering tale without any great level of focus. But I think, um, Shotil, the author um, really cracks it because she does centre so much on really getting into the depths of the characters. I was actually listening to, um, excuse me while I just look away, because I was actually listening to um, an interview that she gave and she was talking about the characterization in the book and she quotes um, Toni Morrison who, you know, as 
most of you know, is an amazing um, black American author who says that the point of a novel is that most characters are either dealing with some sort of shame or self-loathing and they need to be forced to confront it or they either choose to change or not to change. So the hardest part of yeah, any wow. write, writing any novel is trying to depict that kind of um, challenge, the push-pull, um, the backstory. Um, and I think that the author in this case largely came to really delving deep into the characters after she'd done the first draft. Mm. So once she got the basic plot um, and the basic who's who's and where where's where, she then decided to go back in and fill out those characters. Mm. So really kind of delving deep into, well, where's their doubt? Where's their self-loathing? Mm. Where does it where does it come from? And where's that actually going to leave us? And I think she did it amazingly well. I think probably one of the things to point out about that is that the story of Olga is almost like semi autobiographical what's what auto uh biographical sorry that's a tongue twister <laughs> um is the fact that um so chill the author you know she did grow up in south brooklyn she had a mum that was fighting for um the revolutionary she had she was working in the wedding business she had a very successful career as a wedding court organizer um and so i actually also was listening to an interview with her and um she, they asked the question, well, why didn't you write this book as nonfiction? And she, again, something that we've, uh, we keep talking about this in book club, the beauty of fiction. And she actually says that, well, to, if I did it in, in nonfiction, I feel like I wouldn't, not embellish, but I wouldn't be able to really delve into all of the different characters and how they're feeling and all of this if it wasn't for fiction. So I think, yeah. If, it, if she was writing it from a non-fiction, from, a, from um, an autobiographical perspective, then she's only got her perspective, hasn't she? Yeah, and correct. And as we know, memory is faulty. You know, we, we never actually remember things as they truly occurred. We always, have, we always um, remember them imperfectly or certainly subjectively. So I guess, you know, one can write from one's own perspective but really can't write into the thoughts and motivations of other people if it's nonfiction. Exactly. And one of the um, the things that I guess she changed is that she didn't have a brother. So in this book, Olga has this brother and um, she writes it so well considering that she doesn't have a brother because you've really got this camaraderie of siblings. Like one of my favourite scenes, um, and this isn't so much of a spoiler, is that uh, they're in the doctor's office together and Olga's really trying to help him out with something quite serious and he's getting so frustrated with Olga and annoyed at her because she's, you know, being the bossy boots and bossing him around. And you can just imagine that scene of like, I have moments like that with my sister all the time when I'm bossing her around because I'm helping her, but she gets frustrated at me because I'm bossing her around, even though I'm trying to do, you know, there was this beautiful relationship. And, she, and um, when I was listening to this interview with Olga, she was saying that when um, you grew up in, um, in when, when she was growing up in South Brooklyn, there was this, um, are they called Irish twins where you kind of like, oh, well, yeah, where you have to go somewhere because your brother's going there. Yeah, quite close in age. Yeah, exactly. So there was this like, um, I guess she developed these relationships that were similar to siblings. And I think um, one of the other interesting things in the book is that the the fact that you can have two siblings have the same uh, series of events, so their dad passing away from AIDS and their mother leaving them, but yet they deal with it in very, very different ways. I mean, um, actually, just going back to um, the it being um, semi autobiographical autobiographical and that lots of the things that happened. Um, another thing that struck me uh, that I, I read from about the author was that um, Olga, the character, has never been married, but um, but but Chatil, the author, um, was married and actually got divorced at the age of 30. And at that stage, um, her 
ex, soon to be ex husband recommended that she um, went and had therapy because she was not really very good at dealing with life. Um, and she did. And so she now says of Olga, well, that's what I would have been like if I hadn't had therapy, mm-hmm. you know, super, super good at, at self avoidance. Exactly. Um, everywhere other than than inside it is interesting how Olga like keeps everyone just at that distance isn't it whereas her brother is so um you know he stops and helps people on the street and he's he seems so much more like their protective mechanisms are so different what what did you think about the fact that like they've both had the same situation but they they deal with things very differently things do deal with (laughs) Sorry, very, very spicy cough. <laughs> <laughs> You're allowed to cough a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. So, so carry on, Mum. I think, yeah, siblings do deal with things, I think, very, very differently. You know, they think they do have different, different sort of personalities. I mean, Olga can be quite abrasive um, and certainly very sort of stand, you know, standoffish. Um, with people, whereas Prieto um, is Mr. Nice Guy. You know, he's the he's the guy who can talk to anybody, who oozes charm. Um, you know, who is always looking out for the other the other person. But yet, he has his own secrets. Mm. You know, he's also intensely private. I'm not going to give you any um, you guys any spoilers as to why he's so what he is protecting. But um, you know, ultimately, it makes him vulnerable, and certain unscrupulous people. Um, you know, know how to exploit him, which again is part of of the plot. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think we all have our coping mechanisms. Either we push people away um, to protect ourselves and don't engage, or we can affect, you know, this completely different persona. Um, whereas, you know, we are the light in the room, but actually nobody really knows us. Um, so I think, you know, I think that that is, is um, a very interesting and, and, and I think not uncommon, um, you know, story about, about two siblings is that they each have different, different coping mechanisms. Definitely. Um, I have to say this book um, and I think probably just from growing up in Australia, I have never been to Brooklyn and I've never spent much time in Brooklyn. And I feel like this book, if you've been to South Brooklyn, I feel like would, there was a couple of things that I felt like I would, I was missing a beat with um, just the environment. Cause I guess I could never really imagine it. Um, did you feel like that? Did you, or did you feel like you connected to it? It's actually one of the ones I was one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is that I mean you know what a sucker I am for for books that are set um, in foreign cities. Yeah. The thing about foreign cities it must be because I really want to go travel again. I know. <laughs> um, um, but but the but the books that really really speak to me are ones where the author has a great affinity with a particular place Mm -hmm. um you know and we um, and we've had a couple of books set in new york we've had you know books set in paris and and so on and even though um i guess through i guess through media through movies and tv and so on you know i have a pretty good approximation of what what brooklyn Mm. um must must be like but um the familiarity with which the author talks about them really um it felt to me incredibly authentic mm. and personal. Mm. Uh, and so the fact that I didn't know it myself didn't didn't actually matter to me. It made me feel as though I knew it. I mean, I actually did go on to, on to Google, Google Maps and look where Sunset Park was and look and see, mm. you know, where it lies in relation to Manhattan and, and, and so on, just to sort of orient myself. But I, I, I did have a great <coughs> feeling for, for place. Um, yeah, I felt the same. I, I, I really felt um, a level of dis, 
distance from from the book and I don't know whether or not that's just my white privilege or the fact that I've grown up in Australia and that like the Puerto Rican history is not taught in schools in Australia it's like it's I don't I I'm quite happy to admit I don't really know much about it um and so I found from reading this book like you said it was a really authentic um uh yeah, it was, it was written in a really authentic way, which you can tell she's got so much love and passion about what she's writing about, but it made me Google more information about certain things. Like, for example, I didn't know an awful lot about Hurricane Maria. I, you know, I've, I've heard loose things about it, but I've never actually, you know, spent time researching and seeing how devastating it was. And I think probably with what's happened in, with all the floods in northern New South Wales, it really made me it just it just hit my heart in a in a way that perhaps it wouldn't have it just from seeing all the devastation and the fact that everybody in has lost so many homes in northern new south wales and how the devastation continues past just the cleanup like it's going to take years to rebuild things and to have seen then you know looking up and finding out more about what happened with hurricane maria just how devastating that scene would have been and how and the and it wasn't only one hurricane you know then you know then there was an earthquake and there had been a previous a previous um you know hurricane um, several years previously um no i mean i really um did not know i did not know the history of puerto rico um you know for for um just a quick history lesson for you know anybody that that isn't hasn't actually read the book yet. Um, Puerto Rico has been um, affiliated or part of America since I think 1898, um, but but even now has very, very little representation um, in Washington. So it's kind of like the poor sister, um, uh, you know, and um, there's a huge amount of poverty still and they really don't have much self-governance. Um, and, you know, the, what happened in the aftermath of Hurricane uh, Maria was that, you know, the government was nowhere to be found. Mm. You know, they didn't, it was, you know, just a human catastrophe is that they did not provide the relief. Um, they did not provide the aid. Um, and, you know, the, the country is still one of, of great, great poverty, um and and yeah absolutely i think you know you you can draw parallels with what's recent recently happened in australia i mean obviously not only the floods but we've also had the bushfires mm. um a couple of years ago this recurrent cycle of natural natural disasters and and yeah it it did also question i guess it it sort of put two questions in my mind is one well okay, we're actually talking about mainland Australia. Do we have those mechanisms in place mm. to preempt and to anticipate and to deal with natural disasters? I mean, you know, I'm not going to stick my neck out too far here um, and, and become political, but it's certainly, it's certainly a topic of everybody's discussion, particularly who's been hit by the floods. <laughs> on everybody's minds and particularly if you're in an area that was affected as badly mm. and saw the devastation as this area was mm. um and you know for those first few days it was well there's nobody to be found it was totally. individual um who were organizing um and mobilizing and and so on mm. you know yeah so um, you know that is one part of it, but the other, the other thing I think, um, and this is particularly pertinent in that we're flooded in again today. So the last couple of days we've been having flood rain again, um, and whilst we're fine, there are going to be an awful lot of people who aren't fine. Um, their homes are going to be flooded again, um, and this isn't the first time or the second time it's happened mm. um and you know i i think these people f get a kind of ptsd mm. after after a while i mean it must be how 
awful must it be to live with that level of anxiety mm. all the time mm. it, every time it rains it's mm. like well is it going to flood mm. is it going to flood are we going to lose everything again mm. um and um yeah i mean you know there were there were there were definite parallels and particularly the fact that you know uh, the media is great and it's right on it at the time but these are long term things you know i mean there are still people here locally who haven't gone back into their homes they're still homeless mm. they're penniless they you know they're relying on on charity for food and for and for everything else and it's and the infrastructure the damage is you know running is going to run into billions and it's going to be a long term thing mm. before that's even put right and then what happens maybe it'll flood again so it's you know it's a it's not just clickbait it's not just news for um for a day or so while it's actually happening mm. you know it's it's a long term a long term thing mm. um and that yeah and that i think is really very very thought provoking yeah absolutely yeah it it's it's it it definitely gave me a lot more in not insight, but a lot more understanding of what it it possibly would have been like and how challenging it would have been to be to to be these siblings in to, in New York with the pressures that they both have put on each other and also the pressures that their mother have has put on them. I mean, let's jump in and talk about the mum because I, I've heard mixed reviews about whether or not people like um, their, their, their mother and the relationship that they had. Some people have said that it's totally justified and understandable. Like it's not really a spoiler. I don't think, is it a spoiler? I don't think so. That No, that um, their mother left and basically corresponded to the two siblings via letters. And these letters are very, very um I'm trying to think of a word that is polite because I have a strong feeling against them <laughs> but they're very um focused on the cause what we'll say that again very judgmental yes letters. very judgmental and very um focused on her agenda and her cause and what she sees as the most salient the most important things of life a disappointment in her children's choices correct um how did you feel about the mum mum because now that i'm a mum i'm like oh <laughs> oh i couldn't stand i couldn't i couldn't stand her yeah uh, mm, yes i understand her 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 desire and need to help her birth country yeah and the people of yeah, sure but for me if you're a parent then your first priority is with your children but isn't that always. interesting is that like i got challenged by i was i was on um goodreads which is you know always a bit of a rabbit hole to go down because you always get mixed reviews and people are very strong with their opinion and yeah. i got perplexed because i you know, on one hand, I think, how could you be so judgmental of your children? How could you tell Olga to break up with a guy because he's not, like, you know, going to help her be the best for the cause? How can you blackmail um, your son into doing different things and different decisions? Like, you know, and the only time that you actually want a relationship with Olga is because you want something from her. I, I get, like, how could you, how could you, how could you? But then also on the other hand, I'm like, is it, are we placing a stereotype of what the mother should be as well on, on, on her? Like perhaps, you know, like we, we kind of say, how could you do that to your children? How could you, but I don't know, is that, is that wrong for us to place that stereotype? Like I'm also for women's, you know, women's right and you doing, you doing you. I don't know. What do you think? In you, so you, you know, so maybe, 
maybe you do decide that you know being being a full-time mother is not for you and that your life's work is more important and you should be elsewhere and you're quite happy and confident that you're going to leave your your children with uh, with their grandmother um okay but then you don't see them for 27 years um and that you know the only communication they have from you are these preaching letters yeah. that comment negatively on on anything their children have done and tell them you know how dreadful they are and what they should be doing um I don't think that's positive. Okay, think- great. You've made me feel better. I got persuaded down this rabbit hole of Goodreads and I was like, oh, hang on a second, am I being... <laughs> even though you're an outlaw, even though you're a fugitive, even yeah. though you're a revolutionary, okay. um, still be supportive to your children. Okay, all right, that makes me feel better. You know when you go down these rabbit holes of Goodreads and you're like, oh, that's a good point, am I being... Am I being, you know, judgmental? Like, am I, have I thought of it this way? <laughs> yeah, because she doesn't, she doesn't allow them access to her. They don't know where she is. They can't get in touch with her. Yeah. But she still keeps tabs on them and just pokes them. Yeah. You know, pokes them where it hurts over and over and over and over again. Can you imagine the kind of psychological trauma that that would cause anybody over a long period of time well I think we see that because we see with Olga particularly with her love life how she she does keep people at a distance out of I don't know perhaps it is out of protection that she's scared they're gonna walk away from her um well she feels as though um people don't really know her Mm. You know, that's a recurring th- recurrent theme with Olga, isn't it, is that people actually, they see what they see, they don't actually see her, but she doesn't let them see her. But perhaps she doesn't, she doesn't know herself. I mean, can you imagine, you know, if you're getting these letters that are questioning the, your integrity and what you value and then, you know, you're also grow- brought up in a society that, you, you know, you're surrounded with privilege, like you're going to Ivy League universities, you all of a sudden want to be going to parties and you're surrounded with the rich and famous with celebrities or whatever and then you're getting questioned and pulled about things that are way more important in life and questioning your integrity and your morals. I would be feeling a bit like, what the hell do I value? Who am I? Like, what is the point of all of this? You know, you'd be so filled with self-doubt all the time. You know, and the path that Olga chooses is, you know, is to become a wedding planner, to become a super successful wedding planner. Mm. You know, so she follows, if you like, that American dream in that, you know, her her um, desire is to accumulate wealth and all the trappings and to be at these, you know, um, Gigi weddings and 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 associate with. Um, the hoi polloi, but she doesn't fit. You know, she's always, she's never going to be on the same level as them because she's actually the hired help. Mm. So she kind of, she's not down there with the waitresses and the bartender because she's organising them um, and making sure everything runs to schedule. So she has to be kind of like above them, but she's never actually going to be in that top tier. So she has no, no place and then, and then she has her family, her, you know, her grandmother and her, her cousin, Mabel, um, who uh, are still in Brooklyn, and she doesn't fit there either mm. because she has got the Manala Blahniks and, the, you know, all of the, the trappings of being rich and famous. So she certainly doesn't fit, doesn't fit with them. Mm. Yeah, I think she's got, I think she has a, a lot to figure out. Yeah. And, and what, how do we feel about her love life? Uh, about uh, Matteo. Well, Matteo and Dick. Well, Dick, I think, is a... Dick. (laughs) 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 To put it bluntly, for sure, an absolute Dick. An 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 appropriate name. (laughs) A very appropriate name. You know, who who doesn't mean any harm. I feel like Uh, he doesn't even realise that he's doing harm. 
And like, exactly. that's where you just see complete elitism. Like you just see that theme of like, oh, and racism. It's just full on. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, I think if anything, then he is, is more a sort of a you know a trope than than anything as sort of a not a caricature but his his character obviously isn't as fully developed as as those of the of the of of the other characters um and what about sweet yeah. mateo well sweet mateo i think he's um i think he i like him mm. um and what i like about him is that he's not your archetypal, um, you know, saviour who comes in on, on, on a white horse to sweep Olga off her feet. He's middle-aged. He's a hoarder. Mm. Um, I know, a Christmas his- room. I thought that was so endearing and also extremely creepy. <laughs> <laughs> um, his record room, and yeah. he's, you know, he has his, he, has his, uh, he has his own stuff and he's also really irritating. Mm. You know, he... Um, you know, I, I I I can't remember if it if it actually comes from the book or from it's something that I read. So forgive me if I'm 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 misquoting. But he's like a pebble in your shoe, you know, that that is irritating. But after a while, you just kind of like get used to get used to them. Yeah, um, he's almost like sickly sweet, but then all of a sudden has this backbone that surprises you, and you're like, oh, all right, yeah, exactly. And he isn't a pushover, mm. you know. Um, um, he, he stands up to Olga and he likes ordinary things. You know, mm. I think that that's, that I think is what I like about him is that he shows Olga that, that you know, going out to have fun just means going out to have fun. Mm. It, you know, it could be having fish and chips. It could be going for a walk down the beach. It mm-hmm. could, well, not in Brooklyn, but you know what I mean. It could be mm. um, going going to the local bar and listening to, to the jit box it mm. doesn't have to involve all of the things that heretofore she has associated with success and therefore happiness mm. totally well there you go guys all in all is there anything else you wanted to unpack because i feel it. oh you've got something yet yeah? so to touch on the whole kind of like wedding oh my gosh the- okay the napkin scene is too much for me oh my <laughs> gosh <laughs> without actually discussing the napkins the napkin scene is so outrageous but i can completely imagine how lavish it is i mean um as many of you guys know already um jay and i were planning our wedding and then kind of COVID happened and whatever got put on the back burner and i have to say i've definitely lost my interest in having um currently i mean don't hold me to this because you never know what can change but i've definitely lost my interest in having like a big wedding and having everybody there I think probably because of COVID and all the other things it's too much stress but definitely the wedding industry is just it can be so exuberant and so lavish and so um oh I can't even think of enough words that explain the consuming doesn't it yes you know that you it becomes, it takes over or it can, it can take over. I mean, we've all heard of the term like bridezillas, you know. But it's not even uh, the bridezillas. It's the mother-in-law zillas. It's the auntie zillas. It's the, the, you know, the groom zillas. The, the, you know, at the end of the day, are they actually going to remember that in 20 years time? Yeah. Um, but, but it's, but by the same token, it also strikes a chord because you go, well, of course it's imp- of course it's important what the napkins look like. You know, it's of course it's important that everything that everything is perfect because it has to be perfect. It's the perfect it's the perfect day, and the more money you've got, the more perfect yeah. it can become. Yeah, there was say so there was um, um, again. Um, the author, it, it, it may have been the same interview that, that you were listening to, the author was was not sort of, you know, not telling tales out of school from her from her time when she actually was a wedding planner, but um, she, she was saying that there was one particular wedding where um, the, the bride was so obsessed that, you know, she had to be 
perfect that she said to the makeup artists to make sure the bridesmaids look like little piggies. What? I didn't hear that. That's how yeah, really? <laughs> really? Oh, my goodness. She couldn't, you know, even though they were her bridesmaids, you know, she had to be, she had to be the star oh of the show. And I just thought goodness. that was hilarious. That's just outrageous. I don't, I don't even know what to say with that. Probably, I, I don't even, I don't even want to comment on that because that's just so outrageous. <laughs> that's crazy. But I mean, you know, I get it too. Like, I get it. Like, you know, your wedding day is often like the big, big you know, the best day of your life. Um, How do you know it's the best day of your life? Well, I don't know if you do, if you do know if it's the best day, but I, you've got that pressure that you've got to create the best day of your life. Best day of your life. You've got an awful lot of living to go after. After. Your well, I know, day. but you know, like you've got that pressure to make it the like the best day of your life or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. But I feel like, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, yeah, crazy job. I don't, I don't think I'd have the patience for it. <laughs> I no, think I'd get too no. annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, guys, that is a very um, conversational recap about what the book was about. Um, I think, you know, I mean, for me, what was the essence of the book? For you, what do you, I mean, you know, what do you think ultimately the book was was about? What did you take away from, from the book? Um, just like the pursuit to find self in, um, you know, to fight stereotypes or pressures that are put on you um, to kind of like hone into who you are and shut the outside noise off. I think definitely like you can grow up and have pressures from your parents or your circumstance or where you've grown up and that can try and, that you know influences your identity in so many different ways but I think it's so important um like I know she's you know she's um an older not an older character but you know it's not a young adult coming of age thing but it almost is a coming of age type thing Olga's 40 mm -hmm. yeah it's it, but it almost is this type of coming of age like finding yourself learning to figure out shut the head noise off and figure out what you what it is you do value and um not what you should value and i think for both of them you know you see that with her brother too he kind of stands up and goes you know um i won't give a spoiler but he kind of comes out clean with some of his secrets and goes well this is who i am take it or leave it it's about it's about resilience isn't it it's about ne never giving up Mm. Um, you know, but always, as you say, pursuing that 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 journey to find out who and what you are. And it's also about, um, for me, you know, what was important was that, that it was about all kinds of love. Mm. You know, that that love takes many many forms, and there's an abundance of love in this book, not just not just romantic love. Is you know that the both Olga and Prieto are, are, are part of a of a big family and they are each other's family. Um, and about and self love too, about finding like loving yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. Amazing, Mum. Well, thanks so much for joining me Zoom side. <laughs> um, let's jump in and discuss what the next book is. Okay, so I happen to have it here, so I'll turn around again. Okay, so this book is called The Good Mother. How fitting, Kate. considering that we have had a bad mother in our other book. <laughs> myself, of course. <laughs> and about you. Oh, thank you. I was wondering when we'd get that. By Ray Khan. Um, so um, Ray is an Australian author. Yay! Um, and this is a really, I say that every time, it's a really interesting book, but it, but it is. And um, it's, it's kind of, it's partly a thriller. So it's not really a crime novel. It's partly a thriller. It's certainly quite fast paced. Um, and it's about the lengths that one particular mother will go to, to protect her children from events that happened in her own past that she's been running away from for 18 years and she is forced to face those events and the repercussions of them 
um, and to save her children. And um, she makes some interesting choices. Amazing. I'm looking forward to talking to everyone about it. Um, so thanks so much, Mum, again for joining us, Couchside, and thanks everyone um, for also joining lonely old me sitting here, self-isolating and doing all the right things. And poor Mum. We, we hope you get better soon. Thank you. I am. Um, I'm okay. I'm not. I, it's. It's not hit me too hard. So hopefully it stays that way. Um, and I hope that these floods disappear and you can come visit soon. Absolutely, can't wait. Awesome, thanks everybody, and we will chat to you next month. Awesome, thanks guys. Bye. We hope you enjoyed watching this episode. If you did, please leave us a comment below. We'll see you soon.